let's talk about the big test. It's not a midterm. We're not having midterms. But keep in mind, physics is cumulative. We've been using this stuff that we've been learning all year. Let's go through an outline of what we've done so far. In the beginning of the year, we had an introduction on units, estimation, and conversions. You've been using it this week. There's an example for conversions. The bicycle wheel was moving at 10 miles per hour. Find the angular velocity. Start with 10 miles per hour. Write it out with the factor label method. Miles cancel. Convert the hours to seconds. And we get 4.47 meters per second. Now we can solve the problem. We know omega times r equals v. Now we can solve for omega. And we get 11.2 radians per second. So let's be clear. We've been using units and conversions all throughout the year. And now, how about estimation? Are you a little bit better about that now than you were at the beginning of the year? We just did a lab with a spring. I had to ask you to measure the length. You had a feel for how long that was. I think you know what 10 centimeters looks like now. And I think you know what 100 grams feels like. Who doesn't know that a tuna can has a mass of 175 grams? You know what that feels like now. Or that a water bottle has a volume of 500 milliliters and a mass of 500 grams. And if you filled it all the way to the top and put it on the springs, it would have been too much. So just think of all the estimations you've done when you've walked around your house looking for a certain size object or a certain mass object. We've been doing that all year. The next unit was on vectors. Remember the treasure hunt? We went 10 paces east, five paces north, 14 paces west. These were all vectors that had a magnitude and a direction. The result went from start to finish. You could find the X and Y components and then find the magnitude using the Pythagorean theorem, and then find the angle using inverse tangent. We've been doing this all year. Then we applied what we learned about vectors to statics. What did we find out in the force board lab? That if you break all these vectors up into their components, if the ring was at rest, we found that the sum of the x components was zero, the sum of the y components was zero. We also said that the forces up equal the forces down, the forces left equal the forces right. And we saw this in numerous examples like the hammock lab. The weight was going down, and the y components of the strings held up the weight. It all had to add up to zero. We also saw this applied to our friction labs. If you pull and it doesn't move, well, then you have a force of friction that's equal to that pulling force. And if we pulled at an angle, you broke it up into components. We would label the weight and the normal force. And we said if the velocity was zero or the velocity was constant, we can make assumptions about these forces. Forces going to the left equal the forces going to the right. So the x component of the pulling force equals the force of friction. And we could say the forces up equal the forces down, which would mean the normal force plus the y component would be equal to the weight. You might recall that we put extra weights on the block as we pulled it and we made a graph. We found the linear relationship. The slope, we said, was mu, the coefficient of friction. If it wasn't moving, we were calling it static. We did it again while it was moving. And we called that kinetic coefficient of friction. These are lines. That's a linear equation. And we had a linear equation for kinetic friction. And we did it all on an incline, too. We had the weight. We had a normal force. And we had a force of friction going up the plane. Because the motion is restricted to moving along the plane, it made sense to break up the weight vector into components perpendicular and parallel to the plane. If the velocity was zero, we knew the friction was equal to the parallel component of the weight. Using trigonometry, we knew the components. So if the velocity was zero, we were dealing with static friction. If the angle was such that the velocity was constant going down the plane, we could say that we were dealing with kinetic friction. We said that the coefficient of static friction is equal to the force of friction static maximum over the normal force, which we could get from the diagram. The components of the weight do it. The weight canceled out. And if we tilt this to the maximum angle, we have mu s equals tangent theta. 
The same analysis gave us mu k equals tangent theta, but for a velocity which is constant going down the plane. And then we did all the torque labs and discovered that statics applied here as well. We said that the sum of the torques was equal to zero if it was balanced. In the same way, we said that the sum of the forces is zero if it doesn't accelerate up or down or accelerate right or left. We found that the force times a distance that are perpendicular to each other is equal to a torque. And to make something balance about a pivot, we said the torque's counterclockwise equals the torque clockwise. In a similar way, we would say the force is up equal forces down. So this is statics linearly. This is statics in a rotational sense. And then in chapter four, we learned about kinematics. It was motion, what we were studying, motion without regard for its cause. You learned about velocity, distance, time, and then we added in an acceleration. Of course, we did all this in labs. We had a ball rolling across. We had a little electric car going across, and we made the graphs. If it was moving at a constant velocity, we got a straight line. The slope was the velocity. We did it again for something moving fast and got a higher slope. It was a higher velocity. Then we rolled it downhill and we found a curve because it was speeding up. We got a steeper slope as time went on because we were going faster and faster. So we saw for a ball rolling down a hill, we got this graph. The velocity increased linearly. We did see that because of the slopes of the tangent lines. And we found the slope of the velocity graph to give us the acceleration. The slope was constant, so we had a constant acceleration. Then we looked at it all in reverse order. We looked at the area under the acceleration graph, which was broken up into little change in velocity sections. The accumulated area gave us the velocity. Then we looked at the area under a velocity versus time graph each little section was a change in distance, how far we've gone. Add them all up, and we got the distance traveled. From all the graphs, we were able to derive the kinematics formulas. In chapter five, we learned about Newton's laws of motion and gravity. We did a lot of labs involving the carts. We weighed the mass, pulling the cart forward, so we had a force. We also measured the distance traveled and the time, and we were able to calculate the acceleration, we increased the force and found the acceleration. We got a linear relationship. We found the slope to be the mass of the system. And this is how we discovered F equals MA. The slope is the mass. Acceleration is on the X, F is on the Y. Of course, we had to prove this over again with the uh, incline plane and the Atwood's machine which was nothing more than a pulley. And we found that the sum of the external forces, meaning F1 and F2, equals the mass of the system, which would be the sum of those masses, times the acceleration. So it was simply the forces forward minus the forces backwards equals the sum of the masses times the acceleration. Remember, we did not include the internal forces of the tension pulling on each object, because they're gonna cancel out anyway. So it's just external forces that matter. If you wanna find an internal force, then you have to break the system up, isolate this, and then we can say the forces forward minus this force backwards equals just this mass times the acceleration that we previously found. Our study of gravity began with dropping a ball to the ground. We made a graph and saw that it curved upwards. From the tangent lines, we made the velocity graph. From the velocity graph, we could find the acceleration. Pooling the data from the class, we got somewhere near 9.8 meters per second squared. So we knew the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the Earth was 9.8 meters per second squared. We can now calculate the weight of an object from its mass. It would have to be equal to mg. If we let it go, we know it's going to fall at 9.8. Therefore, it would require a force of mg. Then we looked at what Newton thought about in terms of gravity as we go out further away from the Earth. We developed the concept of field lines, as Newton thought of them as little fingers of force accelerating objects towards the Earth. He believed the mass of the Earth 
is what caused these field lines in the first place, and that they spread out the further away we get from the Earth. He believes that the acceleration due to this gravitational field was proportional to the number of field lines caused by this mass divided by the area that they were spread out through. He knew that the area would be the area of a sphere, 4 pi r squared. The number of field lines was caused by the mass of the Earth. To make all the units work out, you need to have a constant. And since 4 pi is a constant, it just gets put into g. The acceleration due to gravity is stronger when you have more mass. It's also weaker when you have more distance. If we put a little mass out in outer space, the force exerted on it by gravity would be equal to mg. But g out here would be given by this equation. So how do we take the g and turn it into a force? We multiply by m, which we do to both sides of the equation. And this is how we got Newton's law of gravitation. Henry Cavendish was the guy who measured G, capital G. Newton couldn't do it. It was too small of a number. Didn't have the good lab technique yet. So the first thing he did was he weighed a mass, and he knew the radius of the Earth, and he was able to go calculate the mass of the Earth. And here we are. The chapter we're on now, we're doing curved motion, and it's all about the labs. In this unit, we're combining everything we've learned. All of that stuff about the units and the conversions and forces and vectors and the kinematics formulas, it all comes together here. We did the lab with the ball rolling off the table. We measured the height. We found the range. Kinematics formulas. There was vertical acceleration. There's no horizontal acceleration. We found that a ball dropped vertically and a ball shot sideways hit the ground at the same time. They're both accelerated to the floor through the same distance by gravity. We found earlier that it doesn't matter what their masses are. The mass is canceled out. The acceleration for both objects was the same. We shot objects from the ground that landed on the ground. You built a projectile motion launcher. The range was still VXT, the time up from the acceleration. Double the time, you've got your range. And then we launched the projectile at an angle from the height of a table. We had to use our kinematics formulas again, and we were able to find the range. And you did this in lab. And then we did circular motion. In projectile motion, the force was always down due to gravity. In circular motion, the force kept changing direction, always aiming towards the center. We found that if the object was going to move in a circle, something had to force it to stay in the curve or it'll go in a straight line. The force required to do that always pointed to the center, so we called it a centripetal force. A force causes an acceleration. If it's towards the center, the acceleration is towards the center. It's an acceleration not due to a change in speed, but due to a change in direction. We put the velocity vectors tail to tail, and found that the change was towards the center. We use similar triangles between the radius and the velocity and found the centripetal acceleration to be equal to the velocity squared over r. That gave us fc equals mv squared over r. So whenever we see an object moving in a circle, we have to ask ourselves, what causes the fc? We did the lab where we swung the ball around our head and found that the FC was caused by the tension. We did the conical pendulum lab, and we found the X component of the tension in the string is what caused the FC. We had a rubber stopper on a turntable rotating around. The only thing capable of pointing to the center was the force of friction, and that's what caused the FC. We had a satellite orbiting the Earth. It was the force of gravity that caused the FC. And we actually saw a satellite on astronomy night. Hey, what's the formula for the force of gravity? Newton's universal law of gravitation. That's the mass of the satellite. It canceled out. One of the R's goes away. Hey, we derived the formula for the orbital velocity. Want to test it in a lab? Go to the International Space Station tracker website that I sent you the link for, and it'll tell you how high up it is. It'll tell you how fast it's going. You can run the numbers and see if it works. 
It even has an animated map that shows you the satellite moving. And hey, stick around for an hour and a half. It'll go around the Earth, and you can test it in a lab. Then we move to rotational motion. We saw the difference between an object moving about a point outside of itself as circular motion and the object rotating about an axis through its center as rotational motion. We did a lab where we rolled a can across the table. We tested a formula you learned in math. It was the same as 2 pi r equals the circumference. We all made fidget spinner turntables. We measured the angle. We measured the angular velocity. We measured the angular acceleration. We found that all of the kinematic formulas for rotational motion could be found from, from the linear formulas. Just translate the variables. And to bridge the gap, we saw that theta times r equals the arc length or the tangential distance traveled. Omega times r is the tangential velocity. Alpha times r is the tangential acceleration. All these formulas aren't new. These are just the same formulas with the letters changed. And then we did rotational inertia. You got to feel it to believe it. Put a mass here and here on a meter stick and try to give it a twist. Then do it again with the masses out here. Way harder. We didn't change the mass. We changed the distance these masses have to move. So we call it rotational inertia. Linear inertia is just the mass. Rotational inertia is the mass times the distance from the axis of rotation squared. In a ring, we saw that all the mass was at the full distance r from the axis of rotation, mr squared. In a disk, we have some mass close to the axis of rotation that only has to make a small circle compared to the outside. Its rotational inertia is less. It's only one half mr squared. We're not giving a formal proof of this. We'll do this in AP physics where we use calculus. In order to turn a disk into a sphere, we have to remove some of the material on the outside edge and move it around to get it towards the axis of rotation to turn it into a ball. Its inertia is even less, two-fifths mr squared. How do we know all this is true? We saw the race. We raced a ring of disk in a sphere down the hill, and the sphere won. It had the smallest coefficient. Well, we did a second fidget spinner turntable lab, and that involved rotational inertia. We said the weight was the mg. Since it fell slowly, we were able to say that the tension was equal to mg. That's not always true. Only if it goes slow is this a reasonable approximation. And the tension in the rope is what caused this thing to undergo an angular acceleration. How did it speed it up? We saw that torque equals I alpha in the same way that F equals ma. This is Newton's second law of motion in linear terms, and that's it in rotational terms. The torque is a force times the distance. Think about that. We learned that way back in the beginning of the year. To calculate the inertia of this system, we had to find the alpha. We measured a number of turns in a certain amount of time, and we used the formula that we have for kinematics that we learned way back earlier too. From alpha times r, we can say that's equal to the tangential acceleration. That's how fast the rope is coming out. That's how fast this weight is falling. If we measure this distance, we could check that out and see if it's right. Do we get the same acceleration? Sure. Now, why doesn't the tuna can on the fidget spinner slide across the table? It's being pulled by this tension. There's got to be a force of friction going the other way. Some of you found that out. If you made this mass too big and the can started to slide, it was because you didn't have enough friction. The last lab we worked on is the simple harmonic motion lab with a weight on a spring going up and down. It's related to circular motion, but we're going to save this until after the big test. So we're going to have a test on chapter six, which is curved motion. We'll have a couple of projectile motion questions, a couple of circular motion problems, and a couple of rotational motion problems. All of this was based on concepts from the first half of the year. So it's not a midterm, but you still have to know everything. That's just the nature of physics. I'll send out a review sheet.